inviting me to kind of just speak briefly today as far as uh, what we do at the solicitor's office and in the state court of Lowndes County. As uh, Gretchen alluded to, uh, uh, I'm Justin Cabral, and I am the Solicitor General of the State Court of Lowndes County. I was appointed in March of uh, 2012 uh, to fill the unexpired term of my predecessor, Richard Shelton, who was uh, uh, a solicitor for 27 years here in Lowndes County. And then I was elected uh, to a four year term in November of 2012. Prior to that, uh, I spent most of my career as an Assistant District Attorney with the DA's office here in Lowndes County. I also uh, served briefly as, a, as an assistant public defender and also briefly in private practice. Now, as Gretchen asked, what does the solicitor general do? And believe me, there are some days I don't even know the answer to that. Uh, the solicitor general is the prosecuting attorney uh, in the state court of Lowndes County and in the state court of other counties. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with the term DA, district attorney. Well, that's pretty much that's what I do. Uh, for state court. The district attorney prosecutes cases in superior court. Uh, the solicitor general prosecutes cases in state court. And what's the difference? Well, we prosecute what are known as misdemeanor offenses, whereas the DA's office, they prosecute felonies. Well, what's a misdemeanor? Well, in Georgia, it's pretty much any offense where the, uh, you can serve 12 months or less for, uh, for an offense. Uh, your most, uh, most of our typical offenses in state court, most of your traffic offenses, anything from a, a, an equipment violations to speeding to, mo to your more serious charges like DUI, suspended license, and uh, second degree vehicular homicide. As far as violent crimes, uh, your simple batteries, your simple assault, your batteries, pretty much any type of violent offense which does not involve some type of weapon or offensive object. We deal with a lot of thefts. Misdemeanor thefts or anything with the value of what's taken is $1,500 or less. We handle a lot of bad checks. Uh, we also handle fishing and wildlife violations. Um, we have a staff of eight employees. That's two attorneys. That's including me and six support staff. Uh, those are comprised of legal assistants and victim advocates. So pretty much, how does a case make it to our office? Well, in state court, pretty much someone has issued a citation for a minor traffic offense. Or for something more serious, they're, they're arrested on, on, on an arrest warrant. Uh, eventually, a copy of that citation or arrest warrant makes it to our office. We open up a file. It's assigned to one of the two prosecutors. And then we request from the law enforcement agency who investigated that crime a copy of the case report plus all the information regarding that offense. Uh, then the, the attorneys in our office then decide what are the proper charges, whether there's sufficient evidence to prosecute that person. And then we file a, a charging document known as an accusation. Uh, that person then is summoned to court for an, an, an initial court date called their arraignment. And when, that's when they decide how they're going to proceed with their case. Are they going to admit to the charges or char uh, that they've been, uh, that's been levied against them? Or are they going to contest it and request some type of trial? So that's what happens uh, at an arraignment. Uh, if they choose to, uh, to admit to the charges, then we go through uh, basically what the sentence recommendation is uh, as far as uh, what the punishment, per se, is going to be for those offenses or offenses. If they choose to contest the charge and say, I'm not guilty, then we ask them, what, what type of trial do you want? Do you want a bench trial where strictly the judge decides guilt or innocence? Or do you want a jury trial, which in state court, six people uh, decide guilt or innocence? All, we also ask them, well, are they going to hire an attorney? Are they going to represent themselves? They're also given the opportunity to apply for a court-appointed attorney. If they qualify based on the guidelines, the court will, will appoint them an attorney. So if a person decides to plead guilty or, or some type of plea disposed of the case that day, we make a recommendation. And usually the, the judge will accept the plea that day and, and will follow the recommendation. If they choose to contest the charge and ask for a trial, we give them uh, the date depending on what type of trial they want. Uh, from that point forward, then, um, you know, sometimes they will hire an attorney. I see great goals here. Um, they're, they're, if they do hire an attorney, they will contact our office and we will discuss the case. And, and a lot of times we just try to negotiate some type of disposition of that case. Uh, sometimes uh, attorneys will file pretrial motions to address legal issues before it goes to trial. 
Um, and if for some reason we cannot dispose of it, eventually that case will be tried, whether it's in front of a judge or whether it's in front of a jury. At that trial, as, uh, as, a, as, as a prosecutor, I represent the state, and we have the burden of proof at a trial to prove that that person is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of the charge, of charges that, that, um, that's been made against them. The, the defendant has no burden at all. He doesn't even have to take the stand and testify. It's, it's strictly upon the state and the prosecution to prove uh, the charges against that person. And, that, and that's what happens at the trial. Now, most of the cases that come through state court or superior court, for that matter, are disposed of without it having to go through the trial process. There's some type of uh, plea, plea bargaining, and some charges are dismissed. Uh, but a, few, uh, you know, a small amount do go to trial, and, 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 and sometimes we do have to try, pick a jury and try those. Uh, our state court here in Lowndes County is generally, has generally historically been a busy court. Uh, the last figures from the administrative office of the courts have us as having the fifth busiest or fifth most criminal filings in the state, which, you know, considering the population of Lowndes County, pretty much just your metro counties have busier state courts in Lowndes County. Generally, we'll have anywhere from 18,000 to 21,000 filings per year. Again, an overwhelming majority of that are non serious traffic offenses, again, equipment violations, speeding, and so forth. About six to eight hundred are serious traffic offenses, and then the remainder of thirteen hundred to two thousand non-traffic offenses. Half of those are violent offenses, and the remaining are, are um, drug uh, possession of marijuana, misdemeanor, your thefts, forgeries, bad checks, and your miscellaneous uh, um, misdemeanors such as obstruction, disorderly conduct, and so forth. Uh, my office is funded uh, entirely by the county uh, through the general fund and also through uh, victim services surcharges on, on fines that are imposed in the state court. Uh, some of the things that we're proud of that we've added since, since I've been solicitor general is uh, we've, imp we've implemented case management software where we can track uh, all of our cases on the computer network before it was all manually done. Um, we've improved our online legal research abilities so that we can locate witnesses uh, a lot easier now. And most of all, we instituted the pretrial diversion program, which basically it's a program for first-time offenders, which allows people uh, who are charged for the first time with an offense to dispose of their charges without it going through the traditional court system. For instance, let's say someone is charged for a first-time possession of marijuana misdemeanor. Well, in the past, <coughs> If the, if the evidence was sufficient to prosecute that person, they pretty much had to be guilty uh, and be put on probation and, and do all the things on probation, and, and, you know, and that may or may not be on, on, on someone's criminal record. With the pretrial diversion program, it allows, again, a first-time offender to do a lot of the same things they normally would do in probation, such as community service, uh, counseling, and so forth. But, the difference being it's, it's a lot shorter, it's usually half the time, and if they complete the pretrial diversion successfully, then the charges are dismissed outright. So a person is able to be held accountable uh, for their crimes without necessarily having the burden of, of a criminal conviction, some uh, being on the record. So that's something that's been very popular. It's been very successful. I think we've, since we instituted it in April, we've had about 100 people go through the program, and only two people have not been able to with that. So that's something that we hope will grow uh, more uh, in the coming future. Now with Valosity growing, obviously our vision of the future is we expect our case counts to, to increase as long as the population grows. So the challenge to, to our office is obviously to, to meet the growing case loads and while always providing the best services to, to Lowndes County. As a prosecutor, obviously my first responsibility is to the public and to protect the public and hold people accountable for their wrongs, but at the same time while being, being reasonable and fair to the defendant in that process. So with that, I, I wel welcome any questions uh, from the audience. Yes, sir. What is the most popular crime committed to <laughs> Well, most, in our court anyway, uh, most of the offenses are, are, are driving related. Okay, so if you're going to count this by numbers, you know, speeding, equipment violations, some type of moving violation, and so forth. Um, when you go away from the traffic court, um, 
marijuana, we have a lot of marijuana cases, petty thefts, and, and, and also uh, you know, uh, simple batteries and simple assaults. Um, those are, that, that, that poses a lot of implications right there. Is it the homicide or a great blood violence? Well, again, homicides and murders, that would be, you know, that's handled by the district attorney's office because uh, those are felony offenses. Now, all things being equal, considering uh, the crime rates in Valosta uh, compared to other metropolitan areas, it, it's probably about average, sometimes less than average, compared to similarly sized uh, communities. Yes, sir. Currently, the United States has more people in jail than any other country in the world per capita. Do you have any ideas why that is the case? Well, it's a good question. Um, I served in 2012 uh, on, on Governor Neal's uh, Criminal Justice Reform Committee. Of course, he started that in 2011 to address Georgia's incarceration problem. Um, You know, you can go into social, social economic uh, reasons why that's the case, and that's a very broad general question. All I know is in Georgia, the trend, at least nationwide, is it's steering away from that incarceration model. Now, I think a lot of that is, is economically driven. You know, uh, a lot of your, your, your harsh criminal penalties, your three strikes and out, and in the 90s, State coffers had a lot of money, and you can afford to be, you know, for lack of a better term, draconian in your criminal justice system, to build prisons, to build things, and so forth. The fact is, uh, incarceration is, is the most expensive form of uh, remedy in the criminal justice system. And what's some of the research that the Criminal Justice Reform Committee found uh, through the work of the Pew Charitable Trust. Now, for the most part, incarceration does one thing. It keeps people away from other people. It does very little to address recidivism or really as a deterrent. So I think at least what Georgia did as far as a lot of its reforms in 2011 and 2012, um, it's, well, at least it's not affected my office, uh, in, in an effort to address Georgia's prison population. It made a lot of your, your offenses which were formerly felonies, they downgraded to misdemeanors. Okay. Um, we made some, some reforms in the juvenile justice area last year, where, again, trying to address the, uh, the large amount of juveniles in, in youth detention centers. Uh, by all estimations, the last time I, I saw figures was that actually, for the first time in a while, Georgia's prison population was holding steady, where there was a five-year projection where it was going to grow 46 percent or so. It's actually holding steady, and then my understanding, again, last time I was advised the number, that the populations in the local jail was actually falling. So for all indications, are some of the, the reforms of the last two years are starting, starting to work. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, recently, over the past couple years, I. Sometimes our mouth parents are talking about the United States trying to take um, praying out of school and take religion out of even the um, place of religions. What are your thoughts to that? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit outside what we do is listen. Well, I disagree with that. Yeah, I'm 41 years old. When I was raised, you know, I went to parochial Catholic school, so we prayed. You know, when I went to school, uh, and we did the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, that's you know, that's kind of just where we are as a society. We're becoming more and more secular. Uh, my personal opinion is, uh, you know, we're, we're a Judeo-Christian nation built on those values, and I don't think uh, I think we have to be very, very careful. Not, not to forget that. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, if somebody wanted to come and observe the court, um, say the student said, well, I'm sort of interested in that, how would they become an observer? Well, number one, court's always open, except for rare circumstances where, where the court will, will, will close it for, for this reason or that. Uh, but it would probably be a good idea to contact the judge's office or our office, depending on which court you want to observe. 
just to be sure if, if it's some, um, well, number one, find out you know, what, what type of cases or, or matters we're addressing it for. Because some things can be probably tedious and boring, let's say, to, to the class like this, and some things are a lot more exciting. So I would call the, the judge's office or prosecutor's office or, or just the clerk's office to find out. All the court, court schedules are always printed. But you don't even have to do that. I mean, the, the courthouse is open to the public. You, you can just come to, to any courtroom at, at any time <coughs> if court is in session. I have a question. Um, when you said that, like, if, if somebody wants to do a jury trial, they want to have a jury trial, negotiation is going forth to deter that, or do you, what are you trying to do? You're trying to see if the case is really, um, is there really enough evidence for it to go towards a jury trial, or do you just negotiate with the lawyer, with the person, the lawyer, if they have a lawyer, to just try to work it out before it get there? Or how is that done? Well, as a general rule, yes. I mean, we always try to dispose of the case without it having to go to trial, because it's probably generally the last option. Okay. Uh, there's probably going to be an ultimate, most trials will have an ultimate winner, an ultimate loser. Right. We just don't know who that's going to be, depending on the type of case we get. Yeah, the goal of, or, of, a di of, of negotiating a disposition is, is, for the most part, both sides try to get something out of the case without it going, again, to, to that final option. So yet, yeah, most cases, if they have an attorney, or even they don't, we try to negotiate uh, a disposition of the case without it having to go to trial, if, if it's possible. And mo again, most of the time, that's that's the case. And then if it goes to trial, is there a lot of money involved in that? If it goes to trial, uh, is well, it costing the taxpayer a lot of money? Or well, it kind of depends. Every time we have a trial day, we have to panel, as you can imagine, a large amount of jurors. There's usually over 100-something jurors. All of them are paid at least $20 for every day of the show. If there is a trial, six of them will be selected, okay, so they probably have to show up another day. There's full recording costs to take it down, and obviously the courthouse security that's there while the trial is going on. So, uh, and then witness fees, if the witnesses are subpoenaed from other parts of the state, their expenses have to, to be paid for. So th th there is a cost uh, if the case is going to go to trial. And not to mention, you know, the person that's accused is probably going to have to take off from work or right. and, and they have to make arrangements for their families, child care, and so forth. So, yeah, there's a cost to everyone. Uh, when you have to do it. So, that's all on the individual that requests a trial, or is it for the taxpayer? Are you saying if, who if, pays they, the if they lose? Yeah, yeah, who pays the cost? Of well, it's the taxpayer. The taxpayer. No, no. If someone's convicted, mm -hmm. then they can certainly, the court can certainly assess them a fine. Right. You know, in theory, if, if they pay that fine off, defray some of the costs of, of, of the prosecution. But you, you're not giving the bill per se, it's because you have to. You know, right, that's the yeah. Do you find many people that um, go to trial? Again, considering the, the large volume of, well, I'll give you a good example. Let's say in, in last, or this year, out of a possibly 18,000 charges being filed in state court, we've had maybe five trials, five jury trials. Okay. Yeah. So now, sometimes we have maybe a little bit more bench trials where it's just in front of the judge, where it's less formal. But even then, maybe we've had you know, another five to eight. Most of them are, are worked out at some point. Yes, sir. Uh, sounds like most of the cases are dealt with for community service. Uh, restitution, uh, fines, etc. How how is that? Once you make the deal, how is that administered? And as a practical matter, um, how smoothly does that work? And how many people get get in trouble with uh, from that standpoint of violating the terms of? of uh, well, once a person is sentenced, again, most of your cases, uh, an overwhelming amount of our cases, they're put on probation, and then the probation yeah. office supervises that person, <coughs> monitors them depending on how many times they have to report, making payments, and keeping track of stuff like community service work and, and so forth. Um, we, I'll say this, you know, cons again, considering the large amount of volume, we can, 
most people comply with, with probation. Now, on, on any given month, we'll probably see, you know, 150 to 200 people that, that, that have violated their probation in some, in some manner. As, some, as simple as they're not paying their fines or in, in financial obligations, they're testing positive for drugs uh, as they're being screened, or they can commit a new offense and whatnot. Uh, generally, unless it's committing a new offense, you know, our, the goal is, is to keep people on probation as opposed to revoking the probation and, and putting them in jail. Okay. So, for the most part, people are given second, third, fourth chances to be able to comply with probation. Because quite simply, if we were to revoke people final revocation for every violation of probation, there's not enough jail in South Georgia yeah. to hold them. So, so it's, it's a balancing type of act, uh, you know, trying to get people to, to comply with probation at this time. As an employer, I, I, I constantly have one employer or another who is in trouble with that. A lot of it is just it's the level of violation. Obviously, if someone commits a new offense or even more right. serious right. offense, that, that, that's one thing. If it's just not you know, being short on payments, this and that, you know, the court tries to work with them as much as possible to keep them out of jail and just get them back on track to comply with terms and conditions. I'm All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.